So without further ado, we're going to go on to our first speaker. Um, Mark Essex is Director of Public Policy at KPMG. Mark um, was our headline speaker when we did have um, a Brexit forum about six months ago. And um, in this first slide then, um, had a, you know, normally you sort of, sort of have a, you produced it in January 1919. It had 11.02 on that morning because things were moving so quickly. I suggest they probably accelerated even more. So he's probably been online checking any updates. So anyway, without further ado, our first speaker, Mark Essex, KPMG. Good morning. Um, it's a matter of public record how I voted. Uh, it's um, in the Sunday Express, if you go and find it online, um, which is that I voted Remain, but pretty quickly uh, accepted uh, loser's consent, and uh, now I think we should get a deal done. So why that's, are you in the papers then? Why, why is yours on public record? Is that true? Oh, I wrote an article in the, in, in the Express, um, uh, which was all about some opportunities. Um, I wanted to just, first of all, um, establish uh, what, what do I know about Brexit. Uh, some people call me a Brexit expert. This is, of course, not true, uh, because I've never done one before. I'm learning as I go along, the same as everybody else. Other people call me a Brexit guru, but until I found out, that means heavy one. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, just the bloke who knows a bit about Brexit. Uh, but basically, I predicted the result pretty accurately, and uh, that KPMG said, well, look, now it's happened. We need someone to lead this. And basically, over the past three years, I've had thousands of conversations um, about Brexit uh, in uh, rooms like this and one-on-one -on -one meetings with just about every different type of business in the country, and I can share that with you. I've been thinking about the subject since 2014, so if you've had enough, imagine what it's like to be me. And I was up at 3 o'clock this morning to be on the telly, so um, forgive me um, if I uh, am a bit tired. But that's me, and I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, the Brexit debate has changed a little bit since the last time I spoke. And I think it really changed over the summer. It changed when um, we had the change of leadership. And I used to draw a four-circle Venn diagram. I think there are now three circles on this Venn diagram, as you can see. The three, three um, entities trying to wrestle this deal, um, because they all agree on something, but uh, individually, on a bipartisan basis, number 10 and the European Union would have a no-deal Brexit. I mean, it might not be their first uh, desire, but it is compatible with their stated positions. But it's anathema to the UK Parliament. Number 10 and the UK Parliament agree on the withdrawal agreement, less the backstop. That got through the House of Commons uh, way back when, if you can remember. Uh, the UK Parliament and the European Union would be happy to extend Article 50. Number 10 say, I'm leaving, come what may. So any two out of the three can agree. Now, the quest this used to have in the middle a question mark. We've now got a deal. And the question now is, can Parliament and Number 10 and the European Union settle on this new deal, yet to be determined. Why is it so tricky? Um, I think there are four, well, it's not, well, I think Britain thinks, the polling organisation thinks, and you've had a bit of this this morning, people fit into four tribes, not two. We have die-hard Brexiteers, that's the top left, um, who are absolutely committed to leaving the European Union, probably have thought of nothing else for 40 years, etc. We have cautious optimists. These are people who voted for the deal, but maybe they're thinking it's not everything they thought it was going to be, but remain generally positive. We have people like me, accepting pragmatists, voted remain, but pretty quickly thought, um, actually, we need to respond to this, this vote and do the best we can. And then we have devastated pessimists. Some of you might be these. You might know some of these people. Um, you know. Nobody voted to be poorer, we were lied to, let's overturn the result, second referendum, you know the sort. And because we have these four tribes, it's very difficult to find a form of decision that satisfies all four groups. So, before we start, I thought I'd do a show of hands. You've already been brave. How many people would describe themselves as die-hard Brexiters? Okay. Cautious optimists? Yeah, I know there's a few, because I met them. 
Accepting pragmatists? Interesting. Devastated pessimists? Yeah, okay. So that's interesting. I think that question would have got different answers perhaps a year ago, but I am sensing in my conversations people moving towards the middle a little bit. The question is, has Parliament moved towards the middle or a Parliament fixed in their camps? One of the things that's interesting about the politics and the reason, if you don't follow it every day, and I don't blame you, um, the reason I think it's difficult is there's a trust gap. We have people who say, well, I could live with a deal, but I don't trust the diehards not to pass this bit of the legislation and then take us out with no deal. And you have others who say, well, I could vote for this deal, but I don't trust the Remainers not to tag a second referendum onto it. So I don't want to vote for it in case they give me my worst nightmare, which is no Brexit. So we've sort of got a prisoner's dilemma. You probably have got a majority in the House of Commons to pass the Prime Minister's deal. Not definite, but probably. But they're not doing so because of the fear that their worst nightmare might come true. And just as a bit of fun, I thought about a way in which you could turn that prisoner's dilemma the other way round. And this is it. It's the bullseye Brexit. A bit like that quiz show with the darts, where you have to gamble for the star prize but risk losing everything. So let me ask you this. If you've got a two-part referendum and you know these are the questions, how would you respond to question one? Do you think we should leave the EU on the terms the government has negotiated? Yes or no? Hands up. Yes, first of all. Interesting. No? Okay, so you're gamblers. You're going for the prize. You're going for the speedboat. In the event of a majority answering no to question one, would you rather leave without a deal or remain? Let's go leave without a deal or remain. Yeah, interesting. Now, if the electorate broke that way, then we'd end up remaining. But you can't be sure the electorate will break that way. They might leave without a deal. But that's one, one of the ways in which I think it didn't work here. But the theory is it herds people to saying yes, because they fear the, event, the, 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 uh, the gamble might go against them. Where does that leave us? The scenarios, as I see them, is quite complicated, I'm afraid. Between now and the end of the month, my central scenarios will end up deferring um, for a short extension. There's no path to remain. Can't see any way the Liberal Democrats can become Prime Minister. Joe Swinson can become Prime Minister before the end of the next week. Um, deal is possible and becoming more likely. No deal is possible and becoming less likely. And I'll describe how you might get to those situations. But my central scenario is probably the value play is we're going to have a short extension. Um, the way you get to no deal, incidentally, is the EU have to refuse uh, an extension. I don't think they're likely to do that, but it is possible. And until it's ruled out, it's imprudent not to have a plan for it. The scenario in which that might happen, I can imagine, might be that the European Union um, approve an extension subject to conditions or for a different time period than that envisaged by Parliament, which means the vote has to come back to the House of Commons, and it's always possible with the House of Commons in so much flux that an accident might happen or something doesn't get voted in time. So that's the scenario in which we end up in no deal. Deal, that means that uh, legislation published at 8 o'clock last night, which given I was up at 3 o'clock this morning, I haven't read. Um, but the, 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 if you get a deal, that has to get ratified pretty quickly. So, increasing, but still not the central scenario. Let's say we have an extension now until, say, the end of January. That's my central assumption. And I'm assuming in that period we'd have an election. There are ways to extend for that period of time without an election, but they're quite hard to imagine, uh, given the statements of the various party leaders. So now there are four-ish possible scenarios. Firstly, those devastated, um, uh, devastated Remainers um, have some hope because the Liberal Democrats might win the election outright. Um, it's not my central scenario. 
Let's say it, just leave it at that. Uh, but if that happened, revoke is what we would see. Another scenario is the Conservatives win with what I call a working majority. By a working majority, I mean a sufficient number of MPs who are sufficiently loyal that the Prime Minister can rely on getting his agenda through. That isn't uh, the normal definition of a working majority. It's more than that. It needs to be a decent majority. In that scenario, the dark blue squares, the Prime Minister is then able to either prosecute no deal or deal effectively without having recourse uh, or without Parliament interfering with that. In that situation, it is just possible, it is just possible that he might chance his arm and ask for more than the deal he's got already. And that would be quite difficult for Europe, uh, but it is just possible. Um, and if Europe denied that, then we end up with a no deal. If the Labour Party are the largest party in such an election, I don't have it a scenario where they win an outright majority, but if Jeremy Corbyn is Prime Minister in a hung parliament, that's that red triangle. Their policy is they will extend for a referendum. So another extension, possibly until June of 2020. And then that goes two ways. Either the referendum has deal, in which case we leave with a deal, or remain, in which case we remain. Two other scenarios. That election, you'll have noticed I've got healthy Conservative majority, healthy from a Conservative point of view, a Labour-led government or a Liberal Democrat. The light blue is a Conservative win or a Conservative Prime Minister but without that majority, in which case I think the stalemate continues. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. And I think that stalemate basically continues until Parliament can find a way through or the EU runs out of patience. I think their patience isn't infinite and the idea of Britain uh, with a stalemate Parliament um, uh, having to vote on the European budget uh, for the next five years probably fills a lot of EU leaders with trepidation. And it is just possible they'll run out of patience. So that's the landscape. I'm afraid I can't tell you which of those will happen. My central scenario is we'll defer, and then depending on the result of the election, either a clear deal, no deal, conservative policy, or the Labour policy is probably the most likely. So that's as clear as mud, I'm afraid. Just something to think about on no deal. Um, my wife took this picture, by the way. I didn't um, use my camera phone while driving. Um, but this is starting to come up. You'll have seen this on the Strategic Road Network. The thing with no deal is I think the politicians will be pretty grown up about this. I can't imagine a scenario in which European leaders are um, looking for ways to provoke difficulty. I think they'll work together. It's not the situation they'd have wanted to be in, but I th I, I, I'm sure that people don't want to see aerial footage of traffic jams on the TV show all over the world. But they're not in complete control of events. And the thing I worry about is non-state actors, by which I mean um, disillusioned fishing fleets, operators, people taking industrial action, and people just making mistakes and not knowing how things work. If you think about what it takes to make uh, the port of Dover run seamlessly, it requires thousands of things to go absolutely perfectly. It requires a motivated workforce, well-trained and efficient, believing in the job they do. Not all of those things might be true on the 1st of November. You might have people saying, why am I doing all this extra work for no more pay, and maybe I'll take industrial action. You might have people saying, let's block uh, lorries coming from the UK, containing British fish that we're not allowed to catch. And uh, you might have queues of people saying, I'm not moving my lorry just because you say I've got to have this new paperwork I've never heard of. I'm sitting here until my boss tells me I have to move. And they call Hungary or wherever their lorry's from. I just think it's just possible that despite the best efforts of the politicians, the ports might be a bit of a mess for a while. Leave it at that. Um, with that in mind, um, I thought I'd just, when we get on to the um, issues around Brexit, just ask the room what their biggest Brexit risk is. So can I have a show of hands for a 
tightening labour market. Sudden changes to regulation. Okay, that's about a quarter of the room. Supply chain disruption. Okay, that's the winner. Uh, foreign exchange rates. Okay, all right, so that's up there with supply chain. It's quite interesting. Both of those, um, uh, certainly foreign exchange rates, are issues around perception. So people's worry about what might happen might be sufficient to move the market. Uh, as we saw in 2016, when the pound dropped more than 10% in a day, nothing changed on June the 24th. That was just sentiment. And it might so do again. Supply chain disruption, as I've said, that might be sentiment. It might also be people stockpiling. You might have uh, consumers stockpiling. Um, uh, actions based on fear of what might happen, not necessarily what, what will happen. And therefore, that's pretty hard to control. Governments in Western Europe, in particular, uh, aren't very good at controlling what people think. Um, and if people choose to vote for their feet, they might do that. One thing, for example, is a lorry driver uh, coming across the border from France, thinking, I know the British no-deal plans say I'll be allowed through uh, as quickly as possible, but can I get back? How attractive is the prospect of a two-week camping holiday in Kent in November, port or otherwise? And so, again, you might have people voting with their feet. No government can force a lorry driver to drive over, over the crossing. So that leaves us with quite a few potential impacts. There are lots here, and, and I'm not going to go through all of them. We maybe do this in, in Q&A. But uh, just a few things that you might not have thought about. The, the ones that people don't tend to think about first time. So most people will have thought about supply chain, certainly for the things they're selling to customers. I would ask you to think about goods bought not for sale. So spare parts is, a, is an obvious one. I don't know if any of you have machinery in your businesses or lifts. I don't know when the last time you looked at the contract for their maintenance was. Maybe you did that years ago. And it says something like SLA, 24 hours. You never think about it. Okay, we'll have a day without a lift. I don't know where the spare parts of that lift come. But if your 24-hour SLA relies on parts being air-shipped from Dusseldorf, that might be a problem. Um, if you've got fridges in your business, again, what's your SLA? Where do they keep the spare parts? And what happens if everybody calls the same UK stock on the same day and nobody can get them out of Dusseldorf or wherever they're from? So just worth thinking about some of those things that you probably didn't have on your list. When it comes to workforce, lots of people say, oh, it's fine. I only have 3% EU workers. I don't have to worry about it. And I say, well, that's, that's all well and good. But if your neighboring business has 27% EU workers and has to put their wages up because the remittances aren't worth what they used to be, you know your Brits can take those jobs too. You know they can leave and take the higher wages. They don't have higher wages just for EU nationals. So it's your whole workforce. If you're in a tight labour market, if you're in Lincolnshire, uh, that labour market's getting tighter, and it doesn't matter whether your staff are Polish or British if your neighbour's paying £10 an hour. So worth thinking about uh, the general labour market, not just your EU national exposure. And then on currency, again, you might think, well, I'm all right on currency, I'm naturally hedged, I'm fine, but if the person paying your bill has a huge currency exposure, are they going to pay your bill on time? So how exposed your customers is worth thinking about if their income comes in euros or, or dollars or what have you. So just worth thinking, maybe one step ahead, you've probably got robust plans already. If you haven't, not got very long, but maybe just test them a little bit for some of those um, more interesting um, thoughts. Last one I'd say is um, where's your management team on the 31st of October? Are they in the country? Are they on half term? Where's the person who knows where the spare parts come from for the lift? Are they on half term? Might just be worth thinking about your normal command and control lines, whether you need to uh, just get some people in a room. Um, there is some. Life after Brexit. Two things, and then I'll open up for questions. Two things to think about. Firstly, the rest of the world, who isn't Britain and the EU, are getting on with loads of other stuff. AI, environmental, uh, decarbonisation, 
getting their battery electric vehicles working, all the, all the things that we would love to be cracking on with if we didn't have this small matter of a trade deal to work through. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we can get on with that? That's certainly the sentiment I'm getting from lots of my clients. The other thing is, before we can even get there, there's this other stage that people haven't really been talking about for a while, which is agreeing our future deal with the European Union. The thing that Boris has put in front of the House of Commons last night is just the withdrawal agreement. There is 14 months, there are 14 months, if we leave on October the 31st, to negotiate the future arrangement. That's quite complicated. It's not a lot of time. We're going to lose a month to have an election. The Europeans haven't, uh, haven't confirmed their new commission yet, so it isn't going to be 14 months. And if you want some notice of when it comes in before it's executed, we've probably really got six months to get that done. So if you were thinking of having a break and having, whew, that's Brexit out of the way, I mean, maybe take November, but then I think the speed has to increase, not slow down. There's a lot to do. Sorry. Um, but hopefully that sets the context for today and give some food for thought. Um, and now I've got as much time as Andrew will give me uh, to take any questions. I think my um, biggest fear is the accidental Brexit, in inverted commas. And I, I'm a fan, I'm a geek, I've followed it live all over the weekend, as you know, and we've had long talks. But what happens if the House doesn't accept Rees Mogg's timing plan and puts that back? And then the EU says, well, we're not going to grant this extension until we're certain they're going to do it because we're fed up, we keep agreeing these deals, and then they keep getting knocked back, and they just physically run out of time. How, how likely is that in terms of parliamentary procedure, particularly if the timing plan today, Rhys Mogg, it, it isn't approved? Could they filibuster it in, in the Lords? Could it just push the whole thing? And then the EU don't offer us anything till 28th, and then we end up just not having legislative time. How likely do you think that scenario is, Mark? I don't think it's very likely, but that is basically how it would happen. That's the path to a no-deal Brexit. Um, we've seen uh, some comments from Donald Tusk and Angela Merkel saying that Europe is not going to be, the European Union would not be the people who put uh, as in a situation of no-deal. They would grant an extension. Um, but all 27, or well, all 28 countries have to agree. It has to be unanimous. It's not impossible. Um, that there's a spanner thrown in the works there. President Macron has said he doesn't want to extend. Um, but I think the balance of probabilities, given everything they've said so far, is probably Europe would, would grant the Boris first letter request for an extension. Um, now, if they grant that and say 31st of January, then Boris is obliged to accept that under the Ben Act and he doesn't have to go back to the House of Commons and the thinking is that would then just happen. So if Europe say January 31, then we haven't left. Extension is pretty much automatic. If they offer any other date, that has to come back to the House of Commons. Now, Europe is trying to be helpful to the government by delaying what they're going to do on an extension for as long as possible, because if you give an extension, it takes the pressure off the deal, and they want the pressure on the deal so it gets done. In being helpful, if they leave it to the last minute to say, here's your extension, and uh, you know, they offer something different to January 31, then it's just possible something goes wrong in Parliament trying to get that thing through. I think it's a low probability, but it's not zero. It's non, it's not, I say it's a non-trivial probability. Um, and it might get taken away in the next few days, uh, and then no deal's off the table for a little while. But even if no deal's off the table uh, for October 31, if there is an election and the Conservatives win, then it's a possibility in January 31. And of course, if we get transition, uh, even if we agree the withdrawal agreement, there's nothing that says we have to agree a deal at the end of 2020. So no deal is probably going to be a possibility for you know, another 14 months. Yeah, Ralph White from Rosca Limited. Um, one of my big worries <clears throat> is that we don't have a sufficiently robust civil service departments who are able or prepared or even planning to address the numerous questions that are bound to crop up over the next 
three months, six months time. I think as we go further into a post-Brexit situation, each of us in business will have lots of questions that we didn't know we would be asking that will suddenly rear their ugly head. And my fear is that um, there is an inadequate level of support from the government and from the civil service to offer us an advisory service. You know, one of my colleagues has already tried without success to get onto one of the government's webinar um, seminars and it was like Glastonbury Festival. It was sold out within five minutes of them going online. So I'll be interested to have your thoughts and opinions on that. Gosh, thank you. Um, I mean, I know some of the people in Bayes and I know the effort they're putting into trying to connect with businesses. I mean, they're making uh, extraordinary efforts and they're putting a lot of money uh, up to do that. Um, certainly since the Prime Minister has, uh, the new Prime Minister has come in. Um, now, you might say, well, it's too little, too late and shouldn't the people have been investing this effort earlier? I'm also not persuaded that every business in the country was taking it as seriously as perhaps you are until more recently. So I think the answer's got to be, if there is an extension, we get this extra time, then we're gonna need us to see some of that money that's been made available spent well and getting that advice to business. And we've got a bit of time, a bit of time, uh, to try and get some of those plans sorted. But it's interesting, yeah, I mean, if there are channels to Bayes to, to express your opinion, and I think if you were able to um, respond on their questionnaires and so on, um, I'm sure they'd be very keen to hear that if there are problems with that advice getting out, because I know their, their policy is to provide as much help to business as possible. And I'll certainly mention this conversation when I next meet them. We, we um, had incredible support for this, which was a big surprise. I work with government a lot, and it's unbelievable. I mean, you could pick up a phone and talk to somebody straight away. They answer emails personally. They've been incredibly responsive. So it, I'm sure it is too little too late. And it, if it just falls off a cliff on 1st of November, it won't be good. But they've been incredibly good. So certainly one of our jobs will be here for you as members is if you're not getting through, you're not getting things, then we at least have specific named people for our sector at Bayes, and, and they are answering our phone calls and emails. So, you know, it will put more strain on the OIA, but we'll do everything we can to try and facilitate those relationships if they're not working directly for sure, and there will be, there will be follow up stuff. Questions, other people? I feel like, I mean, I'm a really tiny business, but VAT is the one that's really raising its head. I, mean, I, I buy stuff from America, and it costs me a huge amount, and I buy stuff from Europe, and what's happening with VAT? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm afraid I'm not an indirect, indirect tax expert, but I know that um, uh, on the Northern Irish border, for example, they've tried to neutralise VAT going from north to south. Um, so that isn't an issue there. Northern Ireland will have to adopt the EU VAT rules. VAT for goods travelling from the EU to the UK will be subject to the future arrangement. So for transition, things will work exactly as they are now. So nothing will change. If we get a deal, nothing will change on the 1st of November. If we don't have a deal, things will become slightly more difficult. The government has uh, quite extensive um, documents on no deal planning for VAT on their website. Um, and, and for your particular circumstances, what you have, I, the only thing I can suggest you do is consult a a VAT expert who can who can uh, translate that for you. So, so we have consulted VAT experts, and they still don't know. That, that I mean, like VAT is is the one area where we are, and I've actually got HMRC coming in tomorrow where we're going to ask them. Although they've already said an email, if it's not on the website, we can't tell you anything. So I'm not sure it's really destructive, but if anyone knows, it's a better way of finding out. That's worrying that no one in the room's got a clue. <laughs> neither of oh, well, Neither have I. Yeah, exactly. We all feel better now. Well, that, that's, that's helpful for me because I, I can ask that question of, um, of the people I talk to. Um, if we leave with or without a deal, how likely, if at all, are any other EU countries going to leave and we'll, will we have been a catalyst? That's a, that's a very good question. And I think... If you can remember back to the summer of 2016, uh, lots of people were speculating on that. Would this be the first? Would we see Italexit or 
Dexit or, or some of those things. Um, I, I think much of Europe, having seen the angst we've gone through here and the currency and all the rest of it, might have been put off for a while. So I think um, that likelihood has reduced. That's not to say there aren't populist movements in some European countries, and that's not to say some European countries haven't got problems. Some of the southern Mediterranean countries haven't grown for 20 years. So I'm not saying there isn't a movement there. Um, I'm not sure any countries are going to break ranks quickly, is my sense. But, but I mean, who knows? It's only, it's only election away. Um, I, I remember pre-Brexit, it was Grexit, wasn't it, when we were all going through the currency, uh, and that was the, the first name of the, of the term. I, I, I go with Mark, I think everyone's looking at what we've done for the last three years and thinking, oh my God, I don't want to try that. Uh, questions? Hi, it's uh, Simon from Beta Climate Designs here. I think my biggest concern with Brexit is, is going to be the impact on pricing um, in terms of um, uh, goods from the EU, because obviously we're going to be paying customs duty, so that's going to be passed on probably to the consumer if um, businesses are going to maintain their minimum uh, margin, um, but also the wider impact that um, goods coming from overseas, and that includes components for manufacturing, based on the fact that we have an incredibly volatile low pound at the moment. I think my question to you would be how you think consumer spending will be impacted as a result, um, and whether you see whether that's going to be a blip or whether that's going to be a long-term issue. Um, let's talk about uh, prices due to, well, there's two impacts on prices. Firstly, is potential customs duty, and the second is the currency. Obviously, if the pound weakens against the euro, things coming from euro will be more expensive. Um, actually, in a no-deal situation, we might well see the pound and the euro both depreciate against the dollar, which means your pound-euro won't be potentially won't be quite as effective as pound dollar. So it depends where you buy from. On will goods become more expensive to the consumer? Well, that depends on relative competitive advantage. If you're competing with people who buy from, say, um, uh, uh, Asia or the United States, um, then a pound euro, uh, sorry, a pound, sorry, a European uh, tariff increase um, might not be able to be passed to the customer. Or if you're competing against people who buy domestically, you might not be able to pass that on because you'll get uh, undercut by competition. So it depends on your, what the alternative source is. Um, the other thing I would say is if there's a no deal, the government has published its no deal tariff. Now they're temporary, I think they're in for a year, but they're not, um, not every product will have the full EU tariff on it. Many products will be tariff free. Some agriculture is protected by tariff and some automotive parts. So you should check whether your particular supplies would have a tariff applied, because if it's coming from the EU to the UK, um, government might be taking the tariff away completely for a short period. Um, on the point about the consumer, yeah, the British consumer is remarkably reliable as a source of economic growth. Uh, it's business investment that's really shrunk um, since the vote to leave. Consumer confidence has remained pretty resilient, which I think is a function of the tight labour market, very low unemployment, and people generally are still consuming. They're still booking holidays, they're still buying cars. Um, house prices haven't quite grown as much as they might have, and house prices are a real engine of consumer sentiment. But so far, so good when it comes to the consumer. Um, and in the event of a no deal, our chief economist is saying that she expects GDP to decline by 1.5%, in the event of a deal, GDP to grow 1.5% and continued uncertainty to grow at less than 1%. I mean, they're quite tight margins, and really that's a function of the fact that our economy is, is fairly constrained. We, we can't suddenly expand because of the tightness of the labour market. There aren't the people to suddenly get double-digit growth in our economy. There is more room on the downside. It is possible. Um, that Brexit leads to um, uh, a much faster deceleration. But the central scenario is, is actually quite a tight band, largely driven by consumers holding up. Business investment is the bigger query. Will businesses feel confident to invest if we get a deal? And that's an, that's an unknown.
Um, I think our biggest exposure in, in Europe is, is probably footwear, um, and that will go up. And uh, if I'm going to maintain, it's interesting what you say about competitive, um, trying to maintain a competitive edge. Um, but I'm anticipating 10 to 15 percent increases um, on a on a no Brexit deal. Obviously, you know we're going to get a period of time if we do find a deal, 14 months, and whether we can actually establish um, an agreement with Europe in that time. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pessimistic about that. Um, I'm not on the fence there. The, but the other problem is we have is. Um, you know, our exposure to the dollar at the moment with looking ahead even, you know, to insure companies on a hedge basis at the moment is not great. You know, I can't maintain my minimum intake margins um, on my current hedging. So even if we get a deal right now, it's looking like pricing will have to go up in the new year anyway. You know, uh, I think I think footwear is 8%, I think. Yeah, I mean, we've done similar. Um... I think we'd say uh, t-shirts, cotton t-shirts, 12%. Um, so that, that's an impact. But I think so from the modeling we've done, the tariffs is one thing, but it comes back to VAT again, and especially on um, returns on VAT, because you can, if you're clever about it, look at um, the customer being in border records. So if the item is, or the shipment, sorry, is underneath the duty threshold, that is one thing. If you're exporting from here to the customer, but then you have issues around returns on VAT. So it's really complicated is what we've ended up coming to is that it's a balancing act between, between the two um, and the lack of certainty around that. And, and as I say, the, the VAT thing is, is a problematic. How long that goes on for? But it actually leads me on to a question for you, Mark, around have you spoke to lots of people that looked at bonding? Is bonding a, uh, bonding a I would assume, it's a growing, growing thought, thought process? Uh, yep, for sure. Uh, you, sorry, but you mean bonded warehouses? And, yep. Yes, and we're advising lots of people on setting that up. Um, it, it isn't for everybody. Sometimes, and again, it depends on their exposure, uh, sometimes the cost of setting that up is more than actually the exposure if, if things are of very low tariff, for example. Uh, sometimes it's just easier to pay it than, than administer it because the administration isn't, isn't trivial. Uh, but yes, and clearly that's the, that might be the right answer. Um, particularly if you've then got things travelling through the United Kingdom into the Irish market as well. You want to avoid double tariffs. So, yeah, we are looking at that. It's a, it's a serious thing to look at, uh, as is authorised economic operator status, which, again, reduces some of the administrative burden because you can make your declarations X works, for example. So, worth, worth thinking about that. Um, the, the only thing I'd say about um, the deal, I, I, I share your concern that 14 months less than election um, isn't a terribly long time to do it. Um, people have uh, mocked uh, some parliamentarians when they've talked about the WTO, whichever one it is, 24 I think, which says if there's a trade deal coming we can travel, we, we can continue to trade tariff free. Theoretically, if there isn't a trade deal signed at the end of transition, it is just possible that if there is at least a memorandum of understanding it's possible you could carry on trading until it is actually ratified. Here's hoping that isn't where we end up, but that is just a, a, a potential bit of optimism. Uh, hi, it's Scott from Mohan. Um, I think it's been very short because I think you've just answered it, but it was around the, um, the legalities or appetite to, uh, uh, to extend that December 2020 um, deadline, given that everything seems to be um, available for extension uh, uh, over the last few years. So. Um, you have to, per the agreement, you have to put in your request by the end of June or by the 1st of July 2020. So if you want to extend beyond 31st of December 2020, you have to ask for it by July. And you can extend for one or two years. You can't extend for one year and then another year. I mean, unless we sign a new treaty. So that's the rules. Um, what's the appetite? I don't know. I mean, what... what um, the Prime Minister has said is he has no intention of doing so, but of course we have an election between now and then where we might change our Prime Minister or uh, the Prime Minister might be encouraged to change his position depending on where the other parties stand. So it's not at all certain, but the government's policy today is they will not seek that extension. So the time to negotiate the European Free Trade Agreement is really six months? To, to be sure, yes, six months. Well, uh, it's, it's eight months. 
less time for an election and Christmas and everything else. So, so forgive my ignorance here. So the intention at the moment with the deal is to negotiate a free trade arrangement. However, they're tying themselves up in knots and not being able to deliver that. Well, it's, a, it's an ambitious time frame, is I think how I would put it. It's never ever been done before anywhere in the world, as I understand it. Uh, the, the argument is we're starting from alignment, but I mean... So isn't all this pokem at the moment? Is, sorry? Isn't it all just smoke at the moment? It's just not going to happen. Well, I, I mean, nobody thought there would be a deal this month, and one got negotiated pretty quickly. Um, look, it's, it's not for me to say it's impossible to get something done in the time frame. I think I'd go as far as to say it's quite ambitious and unprecedented. Sorry, one thing just to pick up on there. You mentioned the intention is for a free trade agreement. I think it's a, the intention is for a trade agreement rather than a free trade agreement. Is that correct? Or I'm, I'm just, I don't know. Well, I think uh, the government policy is they're going to seek a zero tariff free trade agreement. The question, uh, the, the, the tension there is if Europe grant that but don't get assurances from the United Kingdom on what they call level playing field rules, then if the United Kingdom don't agree to match European regulations, you could end up with a situation in which the Europeans can't apply tariff to British goods, but British regulations are um, make Britain more competitive and therefore have an unfair competitive advantage as the Europeans would see it. And that will be the subject of those trade negotiations. It's what's the trade-off? What do you have to give on level playing field commitments in order to get zero tariff? And this is really why there's some appetite for customs union or for an ongoing, which was labor or possibly an amendment might be attached in three days' time as well. Because what Boris wants is ideally is frictionless trade, wants his cake and wants to eat it. And that's, that's not only is it unprecedented in the time to negotiate that, but it's you know to say, oh, I'd like everything that I always used to have on the good side, but we're going to be environmentally, our beach will be trash and our workers are going to be ruined so we can undercut you in uh, export to uh, Germany. So that's going to be an extraordinary challenge to actually produce that. But if you end up with alignment and everything, then what the hell is the point of leaving? So then you get into the circle. I mean, my sense is that I don't think there's anybody who thinks we're going to rip up large chunks of our existing regulatory rule book. I don't think there's anybody who thinks truck drivers shouldn't have brakes or junior doctors should work more than 72 hours. Um, uh, my sense is that it's about future regulation where people want more flexibility. I mean, half the rules were written by us anyway uh, when we were in the European Union. But when it comes to regulating things like AI, clean tech, it is just possible that, that the, the government wants the freedom to be able to do that without agreeing it with everybody. And, and this has been one of Labour's big things. If you hear Labour talking about this, it's the movement of environment and Labour standards from the withdrawal agreement to the letter of political declaration, which in theory gives it a little bit less clout. And so that's when you hear that, this is what that's around those. Which is this trust gap yeah. issue. So we're going to, Mark's going to be, Mark, how long are you with us for? I'm here, I'll be here for the, through the break. Great, so we'll be here for the full half hour coffee break as well and all his contact needs are up there. So we're going to say a big thank you to Mark at the moment and then move on. So a big thank you ladies and gentlemen to thank Mark you. Essex.